Kodiak, Alaska, Coast Guard ships, fixed-wing planes, and helicopters spread out to save lives and protect an area twice as big as the continental U.S. The air station receives a call for one of their more common search and rescue cases, overdue hunters. Spending the night outdoors, unprepared, could mean a potentially life-threatening situation for the missing men. Listed as the primary places that they like to hunt is Sequel Point and uh, Slope Peak, Boyer Peak, out of other two peak zones. So we're going to start following the roads from Middle Bay, see how far we get, and then continue the roads. Hoping to spot the hunter's vehicle, the pilot follows the road system through the rugged terrain. As the crew searches for the hunters, they spot three ATVs and several men waving frantically. Is it a signal for help wave or just a wave? I don't know, he's still looking at us. Circle around, we'll see what's going on. Tall Tree Cove, we see some four-wheelers below us. They're waving us down to uh, land. We're going to land and see what these guys are doing. They may uh, have some information as a pickup. Zoom on the flat. Roger, come on. We're going to strap and uh, go out and see these guys. Roger that. Uh, before you run away, make sure that we're not sinking or anything. Roger, it looks pretty hard here. Yeah, it looks real good. It feels good. Disembark and see what the story is. It turns out that the men on the four-wheelers are off-duty Coasties. They happened upon the lost hunters and guided them back to the road. Yeah, we found a whale the other time. Way on the other side. Uh, from Miami. Yeah. Wearing just shirts and jeans, the hunters were not prepared for the harsh Alaskan weather. Fortunately, even though the hunters had to spend the night in a makeshift shelter, help was able to reach them before hypothermia set in cost them their lives. Assured the hunters were unharmed and safely en route back home, the Coast Guard heads back to the base. Our work here is done. Now, this was just one example of a case that falls under the air station's primary mission, which is search and rescue. But air crews here devote over 60% of their flight time to maritime law enforcement. The uh, fishing uh, industry in Alaska is a tremendously large industry. Alaska contains uh, probably 20% of the world's ocean protein. So obviously, there's a tremendous amount of capacity and effort uh, involved in harvesting that protein, as well as processing those uh, fish products into edible products. The raw value of the fish that come out of Alaskan waters is over $1.5 billion a year. Kodiak is Alaska's largest fishing port home to over 770 commercial fishing vessels. 50% of the Coast Guard's fisheries enforcement in the U.S. takes place here. To help crews gain expertise, the Coast Guard established the North Pacific Fisheries Training Center. It boils down to a credibility issue. If we walk on board and we don't know what a halibut looks like, then we, we don't look very, very professional in the eyes of the fishermen. We teach them how to inspect holds, how to um, inspect the log books, and uh, we teach them the various regulations that protect marine mammals and um, other regulations that protect uh, habitat areas. The Coast Guard cutters that patrol Alaskan waters play a crucial role in ensuring U.S. laws and treaties are respected. They also provide support for the crews of the HH-65 helicopter. ALPAD is, uh, stands for Alaska Patrol. And uh, it's basically uh, this division of the air station with the 5H-65 helicopters. And uh, we deploy to the back of uh, the 378s to uh, do law enforcement in the Bering Sea. The 378-foot cutter has a flight deck back on its back and also a hangar. What we do is we go out for uh, a period of time on the back of these cutters, and basically we're an extension of the eyes for the cutter. Even with the helos on board, the air station support is critical. Without it, the maritime law enforcement missions could not be executed. We could not do the job we're doing right now without Air Station Kodiak. It's a tremendously large, large area, and trying to find one or two boats is a classic needle in a haystack problem. That's a big challenge for us. And obviously, your tool of choice there is the long-range aircraft C-130 to use for, for search. It means that uh, we probably fly 3,500 hours a year in C-130 time. Uh, patrolling, and the C-130 is our long-range 
uh, aircraft. Okay, today, today's mission crew, uh, we're going out to do a, do a convention mine patrol. We've got, uh, we've got cutters to the north and the south we're uh, supporting. Primary focus of our mission is to enforce uh, laws and treaties, ensuring foreign vessels are not uh, fishing within the uh, U.S. EEZ. Our secondary mission today is just to have a good time and eat a lot of good food and good bug splinters. Each C-130 patrol means hours of low-altitude flying, visually checking hundreds of vessels over thousands of square miles of ocean. It's not just eight hours from flying. You got like eight more hours that you're on the ground. So that's 16 hours of a physical day that, that can tax you physically. And emotionally, uh, just you know, when you're out for searches and stuff like that and you're constantly staring at the water looking for a boat or people, it can, it can tire the mind as well as the body. So I've been flying on the C-130s for a year and a half now, almost two years. You just gotta have enough strength and willpower to say, hey, I'm gonna do it. You know, do your job, do it to the best of your ability, keep a good outlook on life, you know, look for the best in every situation and, and keep pushing and don't let anybody pull you down. And that's all I've ever done.